Hello, and welcome back to Music Therapy and Beyond. It's Alyssa here, and today we are joined by two very special guests. C.L. Knox and Ryan Johnson are medical music therapists to talk about music therapy in hospitals. C.L. was actually one of my internship supervisors, and the experiences and memories that I made in my time in Tallahassee were absolutely formative to the therapist I am today. I will forever be grateful for my time at Tallahassee Memorial. To learn more about each of these awesome music therapists, head to the episode on our website to read their bios. But let's get into today's episode. Well, Ryan and CL, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. I really appreciate you being here, and I can't wait for our listeners to hear everything that you have to say. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you guys to introduce where you are talking from. Um, CL, let's start with you. Tell us who you are and uh, a little bit about your clinical background and how we got here. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Thank you for having us. Um, Both Ryan and I are coming from sunny, hot Florida, Tallahassee, Florida, the capital of Florida that not many people are usually aware of. (laughs) Um, But we are both um, at Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare, which is a collaborative program between um, TMH, which I'll be saying TMH for Tallahassee Memorial, and Florida State University. So a little bit about me. I did graduate from Florida State University as a two-timer. I got my bachelor's in psychology, master's in music therapy. Um, I've been a board-certified music therapist for six, going on seven years now, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, I first started full-time in the NICU here at Tallahassee Memorial. Um, I was the first full-time NICU music therapist hired and was responsible for developing a comprehensive NICU program. So um, just dived right into medical program development and building. And after three years in the NICU, I was ready for a bit of a bigger challenge and um, the position came of, became available to become director. So COVID was my initiation into the director role, which I'm serving as now, um, which is you know just a lot of administrative supervision overall um, for the department, making sure it stays afloat. And I also serve as a training coordinator for the National Institute for um, Infant and Children Medical Music Therapy. So for getting those professionals that are interested in getting um, their NICU MT certificate kind of help with training those um, or coordinating those training. So yes, excited to be here today. Ryan, what about you? Yes, and I am Ryan Johnson. Um, I graduated um, with my bachelor's in music therapy from uh, the University of Alabama, and I did my internship at Big Bend Hospice here in Tallahassee. Um, then I worked as a behavioral health music therapist over at Florida State Hospital for about two and a half years before um, a job at TMH opened up and I got it. Woot woot. And I actually um, just got my master's degree from Florida State University last semester. Congratulations! So super, thank you. Thank you. I'm super excited to not be working full time and being a part time student as well. Yes. <laughs> so now I can just be a full time. Um, music therapist, and that's great. Um, and I've been working as a music therapist now for about four and a half years or so. And um, currently, I am uh, TMH's music therapy internship director. So I'm responsible for all the administrative things related to internship and molding the the minds of future music therapists and all that kinds of stuff. Um, and I also work at our main hospital. And in addition to that, our rehabilitation center as well. Wow. So between the two of you, you pretty much got it all covered. <laughs> I love it. We'd like to think so. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. So something that I always like to ask, um, and I think it's kind of an intriguing question when you're being introduced to other music therapists, 
is um, what music therapy approach do you align most with? And I know sometimes that can be kind of hard to define, but we're all influenced by something. So Ryan, let's start with you this time. Um, How do you kind of uh, like identify or define yourself as uh, philosophically as a music therapist? Yeah, so I would say that I kind of identify with an eclectic type of philosophy. Um, When I was doing my uh, undergraduate degree in music therapy at the University of Alabama, um, it's kind of like basically a mini FSU. Um, And so it's rooted a lot in cognitive behavioral foundations. Um, And that's kind of where I would say that I am foundationally is cognitive behavioral. But through doing my internship in, in hospice and from working in behavioral health, I was more exposed to a humanistic side of doing music therapy. And so that really, um, to, to make a pun, you know, struck a chord with me <laughs> as well. <laughs> and so nice. I, I, really, I really like, um, like kind of blending both of those together. Uh, in addition to that, I also... Um, have my uh, neurologic music therapy certification as well. So I have that philosophy that I draw upon as well. And um, I'm very open to learning about things from different philosophies and things like that, because I believe that no matter what philosophy you have, you can still be an effective therapist and help the patient or client that you serve get from wherever they are to the next step on their journey um, to wherever that might be. So um, I'd say that probably cognitive behavioral humanistic neurologic kind of just whatever whatever works <laughs> is where i'm at nice gumbo pot of everything yeah <laughs> and i i would say um i you know in a similar fashion I, I would say specifically in the medical setting i found that for me in my practice that kind of like approaching um the patient's care within like a biopsychosocial kind of frame it tends to kind of work well for me and, and my approach, um, you know, just addressing the biological, psychological and social needs of the patient, as well as a lot of times their family members, because, um, you know, healthcare is continues to move towards a family centered approach of care. So um, I think that being able to integrate all of those um, aspects of the patient's care is really beneficial. Um, and within that, you know, kind of addressing the biological standpoint, sometimes my lens is a little bit focused on like trauma informed care. um, And kind of because typically all hospital related events have some sort of trauma involved with them. Absolutely. Um, And then for that psychological aspect, bringing a little bit of what Ryan mentioned, like that humanistic approach. um, And also um, just like social framework, also thinking about cognitive behavioral um, techniques. So also a, a little bit of a blend with the overarching umbrella of biopsychosocial, I would say. Um, and I feel like that's worked well for me within the medical model. It kind of complements each other well. Absolutely. Now, one area specifically, um, this segues perfectly into um, where I really saw that biopsychosocial play out in your work um, was when you were training me in the NICU, which yes. is um, which was <laughs> such an awesome experience. But um, that is an opportunity, a really unique opportunity within medical music therapy, where you get to work with the family in a very, very intimate way. Mm-hmm. So, if you could kind of speak to that work and the goals that you were addressing in the NICU, um, and just kind yeah. of talk about that a little bit. Definitely. So as you said, Alyssa, the NICU is a really unique population. Um, Within the NICU, we have really specific goals that we're targeting, as well as a very methodical way of approaching those goals, which in a lot of other areas, we don't typically see that because that wouldn't work. (laughs) If we came in with a plan and stuck to that plan, we would probably not be very effective therapists. However, in the NICU, because of the fragility of the population and just the setting, we are wanting to make sure that we are extra careful and implementing what we know the research and the evidence shows to be beneficial. Um, so there are a lot of goals that we address in the NICU, but um, at our NICU here, primarily at TMH, we're dealing with prematurity. Um, and every preterm infant is born with um immature neurologic systems. And on top of those immature neurologic systems is that trauma that I kind of talked about. So 
painful stimuli, noxious stimuli, um, things that are not normal to an infant's environment. So comparing from in utero to out of utero, very, very different environments. So what music therapy can do is kind of help counteract some of all of that negative input. And we're helping the infant learn how to build tolerance of stimulation. So between um, and music is the perfect tool for that. So whether we're using live music listening or um, one of our very frequented interventions, multimodal neurologic enhancement, we're using music to kind of provide a structure so that the infant is able to tolerate that auditory input, oftentimes that touch that we start to implement when the infant's ready. Um, and my favorite thing about these interventions is actually when family is present, because then we have that additional component of parent-infant bonding, that dynamic, but um, many parents in the NICU or caregivers often feel like they don't have a role in their child's care and don't feel like they can really do anything. But and when we give them the role, yes, yeah, definitely. I know, Alyssa, that you you definitely saw that and got to work with the parents like firsthand and see just how meaningful it was for them to be able to engage with their infant in a, in a different way, in a way that they felt was safe, comforting, and also developmentally appropriate. Yeah. Um, so that is some of the big ways. And then um, I know most, most music therapists have probably heard of the PAL and even those that are not music therapists may have heard of the pacifier activated lullaby before. And once our infants are a little bit older, so they're around that, you know, 34 week gestational age, um, then we can start working on some non-nutritive sucking. Um, and this was a device, a medical piece of equipment that was um, created by Dr. Jane Stanley with the um, conjunction of Florida State and TMH um, that she was able to create that. And it's basically a consistent feedback loop that the device provides when the infant sucks a certain strength and um, a certain number of times they're provided with music um, to kind of re-encourage that coordination um, that they'll need for feeding by bottle or by breast later on. So that is a, you know, overview of, of the much that we do in the NICU, but there's so much more that goes into it than that. Absolutely. And I think um, not only the research that has come out of that work, particularly from FSU, um, is mm -hmm. incredible. Um, but also just seeing it firsthand, that is some really, really rewarding um, a really rewarding uh, component that music therapy brings to hospital care. But I love that you mentioned trauma-informed because I think um, sometimes medical music therapy can kind of get a bad rap for not mm -hmm. being very trauma-informed. And that's obviously something that we are continuing to learn and develop in our field. Um, but I want to ask you, Ryan, a little bit about that because another area where that comes up a lot is in rehab, right? People are there for a long time, yeah. potentially. Um, they may never leave or get to go back home. And so um, you also get to see families there sometimes too. But if you mm -hmm. could just speak a little bit to the kind of work that you're doing in the rehab center um, with individuals, are you doing groups, um, co-treatment? What does that look like for you? Yeah, absolutely. So the way that I like to see um, my work over at the rehabilitation is kind of in um, three separate parts. Um, so we're not doing any groups right now, but hopefully we'll get those started up. You know, they got canceled because of COVID <laughs> and everything like of that. Of course. Um, but I like to see um, my work in the rehab as kind of like the first part is just kind of like inpatient individual sessions um, where it looks very similar to medical music therapy in the way that I go into a patient's room and perhaps. Um, I'm working on whatever immediate needs are there at the time that I go to see the patient, whether that's, you know, pain reduction, relaxation, mood elevation, you know, coping skills, counseling, like those sorts of target areas are kind of one aspect of my care. Um, the next aspect is inpatient co-treating, um, which I love to do. And um, I'll co-treat in particular with physical therapy and occupational therapy. Um, to help with um, just enhance their therapy overall. Um, I have worked on different sorts of speech goals, like within that placement as well, but I more commonly work with the physical therapist and occupational therapist in the inpatient setting at this time. Um, 
And then the third area as well that uh, we actually just started doing more of as of a few months ago is uh, co-treating with outpatient therapy as well. That's so great. there, I, yeah, I co-treat with physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy in the outpatient setting as well. Um, and so that's kind of how I see my, my treatment over in the, the rehabilitation centers. It's just uh, a, a nice blend of everything medical music therapy related and rehabilitation as well. Yeah, very cool. Now, um, do you find that for inpatient versus outpatient, your approach to therapy looks different? Obviously, with inpatient, they're there all the time versus outpatient i'm just curious do you ever get to do like more um more long-term therapy goals or projects like songwriting or recording or things like that for maybe inpatient yeah absolutely and of course it's entirely dependent on the the patient and their needs as well so um for example there's a patient that's been with us for I want to say probably about like a month or a month and a half or so. And she has very high pain and very high anxiety. So a lot of what I do in her sessions is using music to address those pain, that pain and that anxiety when I can. And perhaps even, you know, teaching coping skills for helping when she feels those, you know, that kind of way. Um, but within the inpatient setting as well, there's a lot of you know, different, different projects and things that we can do related to those sorts of things. I can think of a, a gentleman right now um, who he started in the intensive care unit at our main hospital. And that's when I first met with him. And he was, I, he was, I could tell he was just very depressed. Um, I walked in and I asked him how it was going. And he said, not good because I can't use my legs, you know, and he seemed, he came across as very kind of closed off, like not willing to talk to me, that, those sorts of things. And um, as I had more and more sessions with him, he kind of opened up a little bit more and things like that. And eventually we got onto, um, the topic of, you know, I, he, he plays guitar, you know? And so we ended up doing, we're doing a songwriting project right now, um, where, you know, he, he wants to write about the feeling of being broken, Wow. you know, and that's something that I'm collaborating with him on now and we got to jam and make a recording of it and sent it to him like okay you can work on you know the lyrics and we'll try to collaborate some more next time that we get together you know and things like that um so there's a lot of different sorts of projects like that that can happen especially in an uh, inpatient setting when they are there for a very long period of time um and uh, along with that too there can also be you know, perhaps even even something as simple as instrument lessons, you know, can be something that can be done in a long term inpatient setting as well, because it gives them an outlet and an additional coping skill that they can then, you know, uh, pursue once they get out of the rehab center. Um, so that's that's kind of the inpatient side of things. And then with with the outpatient side of things, it's much more um, targeted towards enhancing the PT, OT and speech related goals. So I'll often communicate with the other therapies and ask them, like, you know, what are the things that you're working on with, um, you know, this client? And, you know, once, once they tell me that, then I give them ideas on how I could use music to help assist them with um, their client achieving those goals and things like that. Um, and if I and could so interrupt you here, mm -hmm. could you give me an example of maybe something that you've done? I'm just thinking to kind of illustrate this for maybe listeners who have never considered or, or heard of music therapists co-treating with um, other types of therapies. Could you just give an illustration of what that could look like? Yeah, absolutely. It can look like many, many different things. Um, but oftentimes um, what can happen is let's say I'm collaborating with speech therapy um, and there, you know, there's a patient that has a uh, you know, um, expressive aphasia. So they have trouble, they can understand what you're telling them, but they have trouble saying the words themselves. Um, perhaps using like overlearned songs is a way to help with their overall verbal expression. Um, perhaps that would look like them trying to say the phrase that you want them to say. Um, they might have difficulties with it. You introduce the overlearned song to practice the phrase, and then you 
reapply and see if they can, you know, say the phrase without the music being there. Um, that's one example with speech therapy. With physical therapy, um, sometimes patients are working on learning to have a good um, gait or a good, you know, walking pace, you know, those sorts of things. And I'm providing music at a tempo that matches the rate at which they are walking. Um, so that way it just helps structure the movements better. So that way it's smoother across time. And, and it's also more motivational for them to, to participate in treatment as well. And then occupational therapy looks like a lot of different things. Um, it's very interesting. I actually have a, a patient right now with an occupational therapist who um, the patient's working on standing tolerance um, and they have right-sided hemiplegia. And so their right arm is completely, you know, flaccid. They can't use it, those sorts of things. But they were a gospel guitar player. Um, and so to motivate him to participate in treatment, um, he's working on playing guitar with one hand while standing up and improving his standing tolerance in that kind of way. Um, so a big question that I ask when I co-treat with therapists is like, you know, what are you working on and how can I help with that? And so that's kind of... Um, where that comes about. Absolutely. And can I just say like, wow, that's so <laughs> cool. I get chills like that. Um, that rehab work is just, well, I'm fascinated by literally everything, but I just think it's so cool. And there's some really great research on like decreased level of pain perception when music therapists are co-treating with occupational mm -hmm. and physical therapists and exactly what you're describing how much yeah. more motivating that happens. i was going to say that happens all the time too in, yeah. the, in the inpatient setting in particular with working with physical therapists oftentimes patients are in a lot of pain and in a lot of anxiety during those sessions and so um, in those sessions i take what what i call not like a neurologic music therapy approach but a traditional music therapy approach um, in you know providing patient preferred music to help with pain management, anxiety management, you know, um, those sorts of things and tailoring the musical stimuli to try to help, you know, decrease that pain or decrease that anxiety in that sort of way. Yeah. Very cool, man. So obviously you've given some examples, um, both of you of what like real life medical music therapy looks like. Um, and it can be so rich, but <laughs> When I have told people that I did my internship in a hospital, or I'm sure you've heard this before when you tell them like where you work or the kind of work that you do in the grocery store, they say something along the lines of, um, oh, so you like play music for people when they're like feeling sad, right? And it's like, well, um, so like what is your elevator pitch for medical music therapy in a hospital setting? Yeah, it's funny that you say that, Alyssa, because we actually have a whiteboard in our office that we write down our favorite quotes of what <laughs> people say. Um, some of everything of like, you know, the minstrels are here, play free bird, you know, all, all, all of the, the different yeah. ones that are out there. I'm sure there's a lot of other common ones. Sure. But um, my favorite way to, to educate on music therapy is the time allows is honestly inviting the person to come with me and, and tag along and, and see it. So if that's an option, that's kind of the route, route that I always go to because I think it speaks for itself. And being is believing in music yes. therapy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if that's an option, so if the nurse is like, oh, you want to work with them to decrease their agitation, how? I'll be like, come, come along, like, you know, join me for a session. Um, but if not, I try and use kind of stories or examples because I think that that paint helps paint the picture of what is actually going on in my session I know there's been a few times um where people recently they have zero idea what music therapy is and they think I'm just like holding a boom box like listening with the patient together no. <laughs> and I'm like no, no 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 like I am bringing in instruments I am facilitating the music sometimes we do use recorded music but majority of the time it's, it's live. So I like giving, you know, very specific examples. Um, you know, like one that comes to mind is, you know, I was working with a patient who had a recent amputation and they were obviously struggling with that really big 
life change and loss of limb. Um, so the original referral reason was for overall mood and coping. Um, so, you know, the outsider might just think, oh yeah, they played a song to, to cheer them up. Um, but there's so much more that obviously goes into that. It's coming in, assessing the patient's need, um, seeing if they're in any pain, because that might be a priority over their, their coping that is going on at the moment. Um, but then knowing what songs to utilize for the affect that you're observing, the nonverbal behavior you're observing from the patient to effectively increase their mood, effectively build rapport. Um, so you can actually have an impactful session rather than just be like, yeah, a nice lady stopped by and played me a song and it was nice versus <laughs> I don't ever talk to anybody. I live alone and you've come in and helped me change my perspective of how I'm going to continue throughout this process. Um, so, and that's not me as a person, that's the, the art of music therapy of being able to provide that service and being a good clinician and trained clinician to take it from a, that felt good to how are we going to use this once you're not in the hospital anymore and carry this on for the rest of the time? Um, that was a bit of a rant story, but that's one example that I kind of like to give when I'm describing it is just painting the picture. Yeah, you know, overall. absolutely. Ryan, what about you? What's your elevator pitch? I'm sure you have to teach interns how to do this all the time. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Oftentimes I love pitches that are short, sweet, to the point and relevant as well. So, um, you know, oftentimes I'm in the elevator and then they're like, uh, I don't know, maybe something like, oh, you're going to make someone stay today. And then it's going to be something as simple as, yeah, the next patient I'm going to see, I'm going to work on reducing their pain for them. And it's just right then and there, like instantly that communicates to the other person like, oh, wait, it's more than just the music. It, there's something deeper beyond the music itself. Um, and so oftentimes my elevator pitches look like that towards um, staff or perhaps new staff that just joined the hospital not that long ago and don't know what music therapy is or things like that. Um, sometimes I'll, you know, try to meet with the nurse of the patient that I'm going to see beforehand. And I'm like, oh, hey, uh, you know, hey, so and so I saw in patient's chart that they were agitated last night. Um, do you think that now would be how are they doing right now? And that immediately communicates to that nurse that I, well, one, I have access to the patient's chart and that I read that and that in that sense, I'm a clinician and that I'm, I'm up to date on like what's happening in, in this patient's uh, journey at the hospital, you know? Um, and so that's a really great way of advocating as well. And of course, like CL said, just having them join me and, and watch along and um, for them to see the, the effect of it for themselves. And something else that I do that's really helpful, too, is after the session is over, I'll go find the nurse or, you know, whoever I want to communicate with about the session and let them know how the session went and what the positive responses were from that session. So that way the nurse is like, oh, it was more than just music. You helped reduce their pain from an eight to a six. That's really great. You know, and those sorts of things. Uh, I think in the day to day, that's just how I do it. Yeah. And as you guys are talking about this too, um, because essentially our elevator pitches are opportunities for advocacy. We do this all the time, every day, everywhere that we go, when we're jingling around, walking through hallways, you know, or showing up to wherever we're practicing, there's always going to be an opportunity. And actually earlier today, while I was driving on, on the way to a session, I was listening to one of the AMTA pro podcasts about potential for harm in music therapy. And um, one of the hosts uh, said something really insightful that I'm hearing in what you guys are saying. As music therapists, um, we seek to do um, not only just good, like making someone stay, but the most good and the least amount of harm as we're doing it. And so I think an important, because at least when I was there at TMH, sometimes people would assume that we were volunteers or, you know, just musicians. And so by learning how to communicate effectively, no, that's not really what we're here to do. This is what we're here to do. We're trained to do this. And it's very intentional. Every interaction that we have with patients um, is, is speaking to... Um, 
well, so many things, but the difference between why you would have a trained music therapist as opposed to just a volunteer musician in a hospital, you know, and I think that's such an important distinction. And, and what you guys are saying is communicating that clearly. We're not just here to play music. And I'm certainly not going to bring a boom box because who carries those around anymore? <laughs> right. <laughs> <You know>? right. <laughs> only for looks, only for looks. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. It, I mean, it looks cool. I'll give you that. <laughs> But I do want to ask, um, because you guys have painted such an amazing, incredible picture, and um, I know that a big piece of my heart lies in medical music therapy and the experiences that I had there. But there are also undoubtedly challenges, um, not only clinically, but also personally and as the clinician, right, in your practice. So um, what are some of the challenges of being a music therapist in a medical setting and how do you deal with that? Ryan, are there any that you want to share first? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, I'd say that there are a lot of challenges to, to medical music therapy. Um, and I feel very fortunate that as I've been here for the past two and a half years, I've grown a lot in like how to navigate those challenges and, and different sorts of things like that. Um, a big challenge that happens all the time that we've just talked about is advocacy and, you know, education and other um, professionals, you know, seeing the value and the effect of what we do. Um, And I think that's just a part of the way the field is right now. Um, And that's, and, and we just have to keep doing our due diligence to just keep providing that education and advocacy. Um, One of the challenges as well with, being a medical music therapist is the adaptability aspect of it. Um, you know, one moment I'm seeing a 21 year old gunshot wound victim to a 87 year old who, um, you know, has um, like atrial fibrillation or you know different sorts of things like that. Um, so adaptability is is a very it can be a very challenging thing in the medical environment um and then also the the stories that you you know come across when you meet these different patients too can be just very um you know heart-wrenching as well um i recently well my daughter actually just turned two as of last week and so for me it's it's very hard yeah, it, it's very hard for me to, um, you know, see, um, you know, perhaps parents that have shared that, you know, their their children have passed away or like, you know, and that they, they feel that grief and that loss. Um, and there's a lot of, of stories and things that are just very, uh, they can really wear on you as well. Um, and the way that I navigate through those is through very healthy, you know, work-life boundaries, self-care. Um, and for me, knowing that although I'm in this, um, in this time in, in the patient and family's lives, that's very dark and, you know, with a lot of, um, perhaps uncertainty or fear or things like that, that even me just coming in and bringing music to them, is something that's kind of like a light in that darkness and it's very meaningful and something that I'm thankful that I get to be a part of every day. Yeah. I think Brian hit a lot of, you know, similar things. I would say, I would say specifically in the medical setting, I think all healthcare systems have struggled a lot since COVID. So just overall morale of the organization in general, um, TMH is a great place to work, but just the 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 wear and the wear and tear that my colleagues have gone through, um, you know, it's just kind of finding a little bit extra to be able to refuel them. Um, and obviously, most of the time, music therapist is never really getting refueled, right? You know, but we are looking out for the other to um, because we know that if if we help refuel that nurse, that that will ultimately benefit the patient as well. Ripples. Mm-hmm. So. Um, Yes, exactly. And, you know, there's been a ton of staff turnover everywhere, shortages of of jobs and everything. So I just think that within healthcare, it's just a tough, it's a tough place to be right now. But um, 
on the flip side of that, I think that our, our field can bring a lot of good, but it's only if we implement that good self-care, because if we're burnout, helping burnout people, it's just not really going to go anywhere good. Um, so definitely with those hard situations, like Ryan was saying, and I find for myself that the hard situations change based off of seasons of life. If I've am experiencing something, you know, you have to be careful of that counter-transference or just things that you're going to be more sensitive to based off of what's going on in your personal life. And that is a a total human thing. Um, So I think it's really important to be self-reflective, to check in with yourself, to make sure that um, you are, you are your best self so that you can help your, the patients and the families get to the level of their best self possible during that time. But um, I really think that Ryan hit on on a lot of what we see day in and day out that can be challenging and, and repertoire. Of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, one of the things that makes me really thankful to be here at TMH is that we have a, a large team of music therapists that work here as well. Um, you know, I don't mind sharing that um, it was less than a year ago that actually my dad had passed from COVID. And so for a while, when, when I came back to work, um, I was like, hey, you know, I'm not sure how I feel about working with patients that are on BiPAP because my dad was on a BiPAP and I saw him, you know, um, you know, struggling with that and things like that. So I feel very fortunate that in that time, you know, the other, my, my coworkers were able to step in and, you know, help me in that time. And then um, now I can you know, probably say that I can work with patients with BiPAP and it's okay. Um, and so I just feel very grateful too for, for the team and the people that I get to work with every day, like CL. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, music therapists are not meant to be islands, right? And we, I mean, it's been said many times in many ways, we work best on a team. Um, especially within a medical setting when you're getting to collaborate and work integratively with the different departments and different types of professionals I really think you get to see music therapy shine and really like meet its full potential Um, but of course also as a music therapist having your allies and your support system of of like-minded professionals is is huge Um, I had a similar experience When I was actually in internship, um, CL, you know, my family was in a a pretty catastrophic uh, motor vehicle accident. And so for a little bit there, it was difficult going into the ICU and and working with other patients that had had a similar situation happen. Um, And so like learning how to manage um, the like, because you can't ever remove yourself and you can't. Um, fully compartmentalize, but you have to know how to put it away and when to put it away. And so that was a valuable lesson that I learned, thankfully, at the very, very beginning of my career that has truly carried with me now I'm working in private practice. Um, but it's it's the same lesson. But of course, being in a large hospital, you're going to come in contact with a lot of different types of people. So the chances of seeing yourself or your situation in somebody else's are very high, which when wielded well, makes you a great clinician and your, your empathy can really shine through. And Ryan, thank you for sharing that. That's a really difficult, but beautiful example of how now you can pass that, that on, um, and let that inform your work in, in a really beautiful way. But um, yeah. And when it's, when it's appropriate, I, I do share that personal authentic self-disclosure with patients as well, you know, not, not so that it becomes about me or anything like that at all, but right. just as a way for me to further connect with the, the family in particular that I may be talking with or the patient that I'm talking to or things like that. Um, yeah, I think, and so it's, it's definitely helpful. Yeah. I think, um, like you said at the beginning, CL, or I don't remember which one of you said it, that in um, in every story in the hospital, there's like some level of trauma. And I think hospitals in particular are a, um, a place that are ripe for connection. And when you are not able to find that connection as a patient, that can be really difficult. And that can make your journey harder and more painful and more um, dark. But 
being able to connect with people in that authentic way is truly um, a light. And that even goes beyond music therapy. That could be for any, any health professional. Um, but so we've talked about a lot of different things. Um, all of the applications for music therapy in a hospital, in different departments from the NICU to rehab to general, everybody. Um, what would each of you give as advice to a music therapist who is maybe going to be stepping into a job at a hospital or considering stepping into medical music therapy work in a hospital setting? Yeah, I think, you know, we work a lot with students. So these are conversations that we have pretty regularly. And I know yeah. also we probably had some similar ones and um, because it's it's not for the faint of heart. Um, but, you know, then again, like work in general is not for the faint of heart. Every job is going to have its pros and cons. And um, I think just being realistic in that way, just knowing that no matter what you do, there are going to be challenges and knowing that that's okay. Um, but for medical music therapy specifically, um, I think I always advise students to kind of write down like, where do they find fulfillment? Because if it's with the scheduled sessions that they know what's going to happen and can have a, a hand on, you know, how it's going to play out, this is probably not the place for you because, um, you know, I, I joke, but on one of our interns first days, we, you know, we went up and somebody passed passed out in the hallway. And then we saw a patient that threw something out the, you know, it was just complete chaos. And I was like, well, TMH is initiating you very quickly into Welcome. this process. <laughs> yeah. So I think just knowing yourself and what, what your needs and preferences are, and then that goes for any job, because if you are not quite sure, then you're just going to have a harder time, you know, persevering and getting through the, the day to day. Um, but definitely having a good self-care plan in place. Um, the sooner that you can build those professional and personal work-life boundaries, the better off you're going to be learning when to say yes, learning when to say no. Um, and I think the last piece that I'll, that I'll give is just um, whenever you do something for the first time, and I steal this from Brene Brown, but whenever you do something for the first time, it's not going to be easy. So your first job, your first session alone, your first time, um, using piano in a session, it's gonna feel uncomfortable and that's okay. That means that your music therapy muscles are growing and you're growing stronger and gonna be a stronger clinician on the other side. But just as when you work out and you run when you haven't for a long time, it's gonna be a little uncomfortable. It hurts a little. So just <laughs> settling it or sometimes a lot. <laughs> but um, yeah, just, just knowing that that is a normal part of the process and um, having your your networks to be able to bounce ideas off of and get support and mentorship on, on how to navigate through some of those like more challenging times. And then if like time passes and it doesn't get any better, then reassessing and reevaluating who you are and wh why this discomfort is continuing to happen. Um, Cause we don't want burnout. We need, we need our music therapist out there. So um, Stick with it. yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a tough question because I think that there's um, I think there's there are so many things that go go to mind. But I absolutely love what what Ciela said. Um, finding out well, one like is it something that you actually want to pursue? You know, are you okay with the constantly changing environment? Are you okay with um, you know having to you know, provide some of that advocacy and that education from time to time, you know, those sorts of things. That's a, that's just a solid foundational answer. And I love that. Um, what I would say as far as perhaps advice that I, that I would give for someone wanting to go into medical music therapy would be um, if it's what you want to do, just embrace the chaos, like just, just embrace it, you know, make, make it um, something that is, uh, perhaps have the perspective of like variety is the spice of life, you know, <laughs> just, just something. Very spicy to like, sometimes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's very spicy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but also knowing too, that, um, you know, just knowing that there, there are good days, there are not so good days. There, there are sessions that go extremely well and beautifully. 
and some sessions where you feel like you didn't really do that much. But at the end of the day, you are somebody who went in and brought music into somebody's life who was having a really difficult and hard time. And for some patients, like you may not see that impact, but you know, I believe that for the patient, that's still something that made that ex- you know their experience at the hospital at least just a little bit better. Um, you know, so just trusting in that that no matter what kind of day you're having, you're still making a difference. You know, um, and then of course looking into you know research or textbooks on medical music therapy and what that looks like and what those things have to say and um, and uh, repertoire as well. (laughs) This is a big one. Um, One thing too that that I would recommend as well is kind of like if you start working at a medical setting, like find the people who who are what we call the music therapy champions. They are the ones that you know support you, um, you know, get have a good understanding of what you do and how you're helpful and um be willing to you know develop relationships with with those staff and like engage them in conversation and things like that and um i'd say as a general tip too go ahead and develop your relationships with staff like if you meet a new staff member like put out your you know notepad that might be on your iphone or something and write down their name in a description of who they are you know so that way when you walk by in the hallway and you see them you're like uh, hey jeff and then they're like hey guy Hey, buddy, you know, and then they're like, oh, wait, what was his name? Like, (laughs) you know, and then, um, you know, just develop your relationships with your staff, because ultimately, um, you know, in the entire looking at the patient's care, you are one part of the patient's care. Then you also have, you know, the nurse is that part, the physician and the social worker and, you know, the dietitian and, you know, just everybody, you know, is a part of that patient care. So working as like a as a team as well as something I'd recommend too. Yeah. And um, on a logistical level too, those are the people that will be giving referrals, right? Like those are the people that are going to be calling you like, Hey, I have this patient. We need music therapy. And you're like, yes. Yes. So yeah. Right there. Helps ease the advocacy load as well. If you make advocates out of them, then it's like, Oh, they took that one from me this time. But that's nice. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then they'll, you know, advocate on your behalf as well, which is exactly goes a really long way. Yeah. I still remember some of the, um, the music therapy champion doctors that we had specifically at the rehab center. I have some funny stories in my head from them. I don't know if they're still there, but good, good. They're they're still there. (laughs) Okay. There you go. (laughs) I'm sure there are embarrassing videos of me performing old town road still circulating somewhere. (laughs) around i'll be sure to ask about it next time i see you oh yeah it was um that was a funny day but anywho well i think that pretty much wraps up about everything that we could touch on in one conversation because there's truly just such um rich experience that you guys bring to the conversation and and um so much wisdom and and just things to learn from both of you. So I thank you very much for your time and your sharing. And um, yeah, just thank you guys so much. You're both doing amazing, amazing work. Of course. Thank you for having us, Alyssa. It's fun to to talk about what we do every day. And just this is a way, a way of advocacy too. And, um, you know, it really... Mm-hmm just highlights just some of the the things that are great about being a medical music therapist. So it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Thank you so much for having us. And this is my first podcast ever. So now I can (laughs) check that off the list of things to do. So you can add it to your resume. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Yeah, sure. (laughs) That's awesome. For show notes and resources in today's episode and all episodes, head to our website, musictherapyandbeyond.com. Reach out to us at musictherapyandbeyond at gmail.com and follow us on social media to stay up to date on all the content and announcements. We'll see you next time.